welcome to Account For It. In this video, we are going to start talking about intermediate accounting. So we're going to start just with chapter one, and it really should be mostly review for you from financial accounting, but hopefully it sounds familiar, but you probably need a refresher. So we're just going to start from the very beginning with what's the purpose of accounting. So really accounting is a means to an end. The overall idea is that we are trying to provide information to decision makers. So we want to provide all of the information that a decision maker may need in order to make a wise decision when it comes to our company. Now, who is it that's trying to make these decisions? It is typically external users that we're creating these official financial statements for. And those could be investors, so people who are wanting to put money into our company and get a return. It could be creditors, people who are going to lend us money, whether that is a bank or a bondholder, and they wanna know whether or not we're gonna be able to pay them back, of course. And it could also be owners. So a lot of times there are external owners who are not really a big part of the everyday business and they will often want to be able to see the financial statements as well to see how is this company doing that they have put their money into. So those are the primary readers of the financial statement external from the company. Now we know that managerial accounting, which leads into cost accounting, is where we focus on the internal users. We focus on management. But with financial accounting, which is what we're doing in intermediate, we are focused on the external users. So the importance of these financial statements for the external users is for it to give information that the readers would need to know to understand what's going on with the company. They wanna be able to see what has happened in the past and be able to make wise predictions about the future. If you were going to put your money into a company or you were going to lend a company money, you would definitely want to see their financial statements. If you were going to lend your friend money, you would want to see what is their current financial situation. And that's what we're trying to do here by producing financial statements in accounting. So these should look very familiar to you, but the main financial statements that we're going to be giving to those decision makers starts with the balance sheet. Remember the balance sheet is a statement of position. So this is a moment in time as of right now, how much do we have in assets? So things of value, how much do we owe other people? So liabilities, what obligations do we have to others? And then how much of those assets are left over in equity? That is going to be money that is put back into the company in one way or another. So we're especially gonna focus on that in chapter two of intermediate accounting. So that's our balance sheet. Do you remember what the income statement is? So the income statement is where we have the revenue minus expenses to get to our net income. That's the, the short version of it. So this tells us what our profit is. Now this we look at as a statement of activity over a period of time. So maybe it's from January 1st to December 31st, or maybe it's from March 1st to March 31st. So we are going to look at that financial statement and we're going to um, decide, okay, how much of profit did the company make during that time? So in the real world, you'll hear it called a P&L, a profit and loss statement. We always in academia tend to call it an income statement, but I remember when I got my first job in corporate accounting outside of having my bachelor's in accounting and they started talking about the P&L. Okay, help us create the P&L. And I'm like, we did not learn that. But no, it's just the income statement. That's just what it's typically called out in the real world. Okay, so the statement of cash flows is another really important financial statement. And that one is going to be very similar in some ways to the income statement because we're looking at money that customers gave us and money that we paid for expenses. But because of accrual accounting, the cash flow statement can be very different as well. And remember, we have three sections to the statement of cash flows. We have the operating activities, the investing activities, and the financing activities. So we'll get more into that later. Then we have the statement of retained earnings. And that one, we are looking at how the retained earnings have done over the year. And remember, retained earnings is that profit that we made, that net income, 
reinvested into the company. So we take the beginning statement of or beginning retained earnings, and then we add in any income, subtract out any dividends, and that gives us our new ending balance for retained earnings, which falls under the equity section of the balance sheet. Retained earnings is typically where we see the most students struggle because it can get really tricky. And we'll look at that more in chapter two, if you're still struggling with that. <clears throat> So financial capital, you'll hear capital mentioned a lot, but this is just any kind of economic resources that the business uses for their operations. So a lot of times it'll be investors putting money into the company and that would be capital they put in. So capital, we really just mean money that is in the company that we are going to be using for the business. So it could come from, um, income from the operations itself. Hopefully we're bringing in cash from whatever our normal business is, our normal business operations. And then we also, like I said, could have funding from investors saying, hey, I think your company is gonna do really well and I wanna put money into it. So it could be outside investors if we're a public company or it could be inside investors um, if maybe it's just a small company with just a few people putting money into it. And it could also be capital coming from, you know, a creditor from a bank or a bondholder that is giving us money, but they're going to charge us interest in order uh, to get some kind of return from us as we pay that money back. So that's where financial capital is coming from. So why is it that investors and creditors provide that capital? I kind of just said it, but um, they want to make a return and higher than what they would get in some basic savings account. You know, if you just put your money in a savings account, you're going to get between 0.01% interest and right now maybe 3 or 4% interest. But still, there are ways you can make much more in interest. And so if investors put the money into the company, they are hoping to, one, be able to sell that investment to another investor later down the line and make money off of it, right? If you buy a share of stock, the whole buying a share of stock is that you buy it for a low price today and you're able to sell it for more, you know, maybe a year from now, maybe it's 10 years from now, maybe it was tomorrow that you want to sell it for more. But that's the main idea with putting your money into a company that and periodic dividends. So if we're talking about a, you're buying stock in a company, some companies pay dividends and we'll talk about that several chapters from now, we'll get really into dividends. But, you know, some companies are known for paying dividends. There are no companies that absolutely are required to, but a lot of them we know that consistently they're always paying dividends. And that's another way for an investor to get a return. It's not mentioned here, but also similar to dividends could be like royalties. It could be paid out to owners um, if it's a private company. So like my husband and I invested in a storage unit and they said, okay, every quarter you should expect a payout of about 6% of your investment. So that would be similar to a dividend, but it's more like a royalty that the owners get. So it's a benefit. That was one of the reasons we said, yes, we want to invest in this unit because we're going to get more of a return than we would from a savings account. But we also plan to be able to uh, sell this investment down the line about five years later and make a big return. The reason that creditors, as I mentioned just a minute ago, the reason they are going to put their money into your company is because they're going to get interest back. So this is kind of the, how banks work. So the main way that they make money is they have all of the customers putting their money in the bank and they're giving them, like I said, 0.01%, maybe one, two, three percent return. And then they take your money and they loan it out to other people for a much higher rate. And that difference there is how they can make money. Of course, they're taking on the risk themselves, but that's why a creditor wants to put money in your company. They do want it to be a low risk. So they're going to want to see your financial statements to be able to help them determine that, of course. So when it comes to making this investment decision, investors are going to have to determine all kinds of factors. They have lots of things to look at, but different formulas and ratios can really, really help investors to make decisions. So one thing they're going to consider is risk. So I just mentioned that, especially as a creditor, they're going to want to look at, am I going to be able to get my money back at the end? You're not going to loan a friend a thousand dollars that you know 
he never pays anyone back. That's too big of a risk and there's not enough of a reward for that. So that's the same thing the bank's looking for or a bondholder is looking for. But um, same thing with, with investors. They're like, you know, I want to make sure I'm not going to put all this money into this company and then they go bankrupt and I lose all my capital. So we're looking at how risky it is. But typically, the higher the risk the investor is willing to take, the higher the potential return. That is why people are willing to take a risk is because they're hoping for a high return. So that's one of the big things we're going to look at as an investor is the rate of return. So here's what this formula looks like. We have our dividends or any kind of income from the company plus the share price appreciation. So again, this is where I paid $10 for a share of stock. I sold it for $12. That would be a $2 share appreciation price. So we would take that $2 plus any dividends, maybe we got 50 cents in dividends and that would give us $2.50 as the numerator. Then the denominator is our initial investment. So I said we paid $10 for this. So the initial investment would be $10. We have dividends of 50 cents. We have a share price appreciation of $2. So it'd be $2.50 divided by the $10. But let me look at an example so we can work through this together. <clears throat> it's better to have a visual, right? So you, the investor, provided Big Sales Company. That sounds like a, a good one to invest in, right? <laughs> How can you go wrong with it? Um, you provided them with $20,000 when you purchasing stock in December of 2025. You received $500 in div dividends during 2026. And you sell your ownership to another investor at the end of 2026 for $20,800. So what's the rate of return? So we take those dividends, the $500 in dividends, plus the $800 that they made in it. They invested $20,000. They sold it for $20,800. So the difference, the $800 is the share price appreciation. Then we just divide it by that initial investment and we get 6.5% return which is a good bit higher than you're going to be able to find in just a regular savings account or even a CD most of the time. Like I said, rate, investors want the highest rate of return and they want that within their risk tolerance. So if we all took a risk tolerance test, we're all going to fall somewhere differently. Some people are like, no, I don't want any risk. And they're probably going to get a lower return. Other people are like, I am not risk adverse at all. I'm willing to take on whatever risk I have to to get a big return. I'm putting all my money in cryptocurrency. That could turn out really well, but you're also going to have losses throughout that as well. So hopefully it balances out if that is the situation for you. I will say the younger you are, the more risk you should be willing to take financially because you have more time to smooth out any you know, any negative, any downturns that you have. So as you get closer to retirement, I'm going to be needing that money soon. Then you want to pull back on any risk. So um, basically the same thing here. So risk and uncertainty, that's what we're looking for in the financial statements. So even if you were to take all of these accounting classes and you like, you know, I didn't even end up being an accountant, if that ends up being the case for you you will still be able to read financial statements, which will help you immensely when it comes to investing for the rest of your life. I talked to someone recently who was probably about 70 years old. She said, my husband and I have never really invested because we don't know what's a good company. We, somebody gives us financial statements and we're like, we have no idea what this means. So if we could just read financial statements, if we could have done that our whole lives, we could have made wise investments, but instead we were just too afraid. So at the end of the day, just being able to read these financial statements after taking all these accounting classes, that in itself can really help you to be a successful investor because you have that knowledge. So hopefully you will become an accountant and love it, but um, either way, it will be very valuable information. <clears throat> so let's do a little test and then I'm going to end this video and then you can pick up with the next video to continue in chapter one. So let's put your shoe, yourself in the shoes of the investor. You have $10,000 set aside with intentions to earn a return. 
So which of these three options would you choose? First, you deposit into a savings account making 3.5% interest. Okay, so you've got $10,000, you're making 3.5% interest, and anytime we see an interest rate, it is annual. That is what you would get for the whole year. Option two, you purchase a government bond earning 7% interest. Now, government bonds are known to be very safe investments. So that is an option you could consider if you're pretty risk adverse. There are bonds that are riskier and those would be high yield bonds. Now, yield means a return. So that means they have a higher return, but that's for good reason because it's going to be a riskier investment. But government bonds are known for being safe investments. And that's where you're the banker and you are lending them money and you're getting interest just like the bank would. Option three, you purchase the stock of a growing corporation that was established seven years ago. So which one would you choose? I mean, kind of hard to say for sure because we're not looking at the financial statements for option number three. I want to know more about this. Um, you know, it would have been great if we would have gotten in on Amazon, maybe even seven years into their business. We could have made a lot of money. But there are, you know, a million companies that didn't make it <laughs> compared to every one that makes it big, right? So it'd be great to be able to see what their financial statements show about them. And it helps us to learn their character and attitude towards debt and how much cash they're keeping on hand and what kind of investments they're making and things like that. You know, I kind of, I'm, I am a little more risky when it comes to finances. So I would lean towards option three for sure. But of course you're going to need to have money in a savings account for emergency funds. You can't put all of your money into investments and you definitely don't want to invest money that you need to pay your rent and utilities, right? Or pay for your food so all right so make sure that you pick up with the next video so that we can continue together through chapter one in intermediate accounting